Hi everybody, this short tutorial is going to give you some tips and tricks for presenting your assessments, particularly in Word, Microsoft Word, but some of these will apply across different presentation applications. In this tutorial, we're going to talk about the School of Information and Communication Guidelines for presenting assessments. We're going to talk about the importance of having a clear and concise cover page. We'll also talk about what you can do to present your assessments within the text. So we'll talk about formatting, headings, page breaks, section breaks, and things like that. And we'll finish with a quick uh, discussion of APA referencing and how you can make sure that you put your best foot forward with that in your assessments. Okay, the School of Information and Communication Studies has some presentation guidelines for assessment items, and these go across all of the subjects within our school. Now, these guidelines are designed to help you understand how you need to present your assessments, and they should be your first port of call. They give you all of the basics that you need, and uh, unless you have otherwise heard differently from your subject coordinator, this is where you should go to make sure that you're following the uh, guidelines for presenting your assessments correctly. Your cover page is usually the first thing that the person marking your assessment sees when they open up your submission. It's really important, therefore, to include all of the relevant information and to include it as clearly as possible. It's also important that you only include what is necessary so that you don't crowd the page with unnecessary information. The key things that you need are outlined in this table and they include your name, your student number and the lecturer of your subject or the subject coordinator as we call them. Also the subject code and the name of this of the subject that you are completing and the name of or at the very least the assessment item number. Now, Oftentimes, the subject coordinator may not be the person marking your assessment task, and so the person marking may not be familiar with you, and that's why it's very important to include all of this relevant information. It's also important to include the title of your assessment and the word count. Now, the word count, you need to include two things. You need to include the word count as it is set out in the task, and the actual word count, the word count that you have submitted. So if the task is asking you to submit 3,000 words and you've written 2,890, then you need to include the word count as per task in the first box, 3,000, and in the second, 2,890, which is your word count. If the word count has been broken up over several sections, so for example, you need to write 500 words for part A, 600 words for part B, and 1,000 words for part C, then you need to submit the word count separated out like that. So you need to indicate how many of the 500 words you wrote, say 480, how many of the 600 words you wrote, say 605, and how many of the 1,000 words. Don't group the words together into a total so in this case, you would write how many out of 1,100. Don't do that because oftentimes the word count for each section is important. And if you've written, um, say, only 250 words for the 500 word uh, part A, that actually will limit your capacity to respond effectively to that part of the task. And even though the overall word count may still come out correctly, it's very important that you meet the individual word counts in order to give your best efforts to each part of the task. Now, you can download a sample cover page, which is simply this, uh, bo this box here, this table, and complete this. And that's a really good way of making sure that you cover all of the most important and relevant information for each of your assessments. Let's talk now about formatting your text within your document. Now, the six presentation guidelines give you really clear instructions on what you need to do. You need to make sure that your writing has 1.5 line spacing unless otherwise indicated, 
that you have 2.5 centimetre margins and that you use a standard font, for example, Arial or Calibri or Times New Roman, in 12 point size. Now, the reason these things are so important is that often the marker will be marking many assignments and they'll all be down on the screen. And so after a little while, the marker's eyes do get tired and it is really important to provide lots of white space and to make sure that your writing is really clear and legible on the screen for the markers. You should also consider using headers and footers. In the header, you should include your name, student number, the subject code and the assessment number. And in the footer, include page numbers, excluding the title page or the cover page that we've just talked about. Now, those headers and footers are optional extras but they do make it much easier for whoever is reading your submission to locate themselves within the text and to remind themselves of whose work they are marking. And so it is really worth, what, worth taking the time. It only takes about a minute at the most to set up headers and footers, and it's really worth it in terms of making the life of the marker easier and your document easier to and more navigable, which is just good professional practice. Let's see in more detail how this is done. Let's go right into Word and I'll talk about this a bit more. So what we're looking for is a Word document that's been set up with 2.5 centimetre margins. So to do that, we go to the Layout menu and we can see that Margins is here. Now, the standard normal margin is close enough to the outline. It says 2.5, the normal margins are 2.54, which is close enough. So just make sure that you've set the margins to normal and your, and your layout will be fine. The next thing we need to do is to ensure that our text is the right size and the right font. So if we just go back to home, when we start typing, here is my first assessment. I am writing very quickly. Okay, so we just basically highlight, check their font. It's pretty straightforward. We could have Calibri, Arial, Times New Roman are the three that I would recommend the most. Change the font to 12 point. That's what we're looking for. And we want the line spacing to be at 1.5, which is symbolized by this little blue up and down arrow. And we want 1.5 here. So when I press enter, you can see that the line is nicely spaced. That's fairly obvious. Now with headers and footers, there's two ways that we can do this. You can simply scroll down and double click right down in the bottom and that will open up headers and footers for you. What you definitely want is you definitely want a different first page because you don't want information to be recorded on the front page. So we uh, want to move into our next page. So let's just insert a page break here so that I can go down onto the next page. Now to open up headers and footers when we're not normally there, we go to the insert and we can open up header or footer. Now in the footer, we want just a page number. So there's a number of different um, layouts for page numbers. You can choose this one or Austin. So here's the page number. Now that'll automatically add each page. That one there comes with a border around it. I don't think we really need that border. So we can um, go back in and edit that by going here and choosing that we want the bottom page number at the bottom. Uh, there we go. This is what we want. There we go. That's better. Now at the top, we enter in our name, student number, and then we can also enter in our subject and assignment two, the number of the assignment. And when we close the header and footer, this will appear now on every page that we uh, include, but not on the first page, because remember we chose that box that said a different front page. Now another way you can make your text 
more easily readable is by using headings. And using heading, the headings uh, formatting in Word can make your formatting more organised and makes it much quicker and easier to manage. You can also use headings to quickly and automatically create a table of contents. Now, a table of contents is not necessary in all assessment pieces, but if it is, it's so much simpler and quicker if you've been using headings throughout. Let's have a quick look in Word at how you do this. Using headings can make the organisation of your paper much more easy to control because you don't have to remember the size and the font and the choices that you made for each type of heading. So here you can see that I have written that assignment one and this is an example of a first level heading. Now you wouldn't normally put that first level heading there, but just to show you how easy this is, I go up to the styles and I simply click heading one and it will format as a first level heading. I then, uh, uh, during my text, get to a subtitle, which is a second level heading, and all I have to do is choose heading two, and it will change the font just slightly so that it is a smaller heading. Now, you can see that a heading three has appeared here, and this is my third level heading that I've now inserted into my text. So if I click on this, you can see that it's formatted slightly different again. Now, I don't have to use these heading styles. If I click this little down arrow here, it will open up the styles and I can actually change these. Uh, I can update to match the selection or I can modify it here on the spot. So if I want to modify to say make this heading a different font, say I want to keep it uh, in um, Arial like my the rest of my text, I simply can choose there and then OK. And now all the way through the first level headings will be Arial. And I can do the same for the second level heading. If I choose here, I can go Modify. I can change that to Arial. OK. And the sub subtitle is then as well. So now anytime I type anything and I choose that heading, it will format it in the same way. Now, the interesting thing about this is that I can also now insert a table of contents really easily. So if I go to Insert, References, then I go to Table of Contents, I can click on Automatic Table and an automatic table of contents will be inserted with all of the information uh, that I have indicated using my Heading. So I can, you can see here that if I now want to add another, say, chapter or major heading, um, assignment 1B, uh, and I highlight that and go to Home, Heading 1. Now in my table of contents, if I click Update Table, assignment 1B will now appear in my table of contents. So you can see how easy it is to create a table of contents if you've used the headings feature. If you need to start a new page within your document, using page breaks is much more effective than simply pressing enter, 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 enter to move down the page until you get onto the next page. A page break is available on the insert tab and it's really simple and easy to insert and I'll show you how to do that in Word. You can also use a similar tool called section breaks and these are useful if you want to do something like changing the orientation of the page within the document. So if most of your document is set to portrait and then you want to include a table that takes up so much space you need the page to go landscape, you can put a section break in and then easily change the page to landscape and then close with a section break and continue on in portrait, which makes your document so much more professional and easy to read. Let's have a look at that on Word now. Tables and figures are often important parts of your assessment. And the key to remember here is that you need to always include an explanation of what the table or the figure is for the reader to understand why they, those things have been placed in there. Now, the layout of these uh, is determined by APA formatting, 
But at the very least, it's important to put the name of the number of the tables, so table one, table two, table three, or alternatively, if you're working with a much larger document, you might want table 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 2.1, 2.2, and so on. Underneath the table number goes the title of the table or the figure in italics. Then you insert your table or image or figure. And if you do need to include notes or attribution, you put that below the image. So you can see here, this photo has been sourced from Unsplash and I've put the attribution below the image. So it's really important to make sure that you explain the reason for these additions in your submissions. In the School of Information and Communication Studies, we use APA 7th edition. Now you can do referencing by using the inbuilt tool in Microsoft Word, but this tool is a little bit limited and it hasn't been updated to reflect the changes in APA 7. So if you use this tool, you will need to then go back in and edit and update the entries to make sure that they align with APA 7. For this reason, we encourage you to use the CSU Academic Referencing Tool and the APA Referencing Summary. Uh, and another option is you can install and use EndNote, which is referencing software available free of charge from the Charles Sturt University Library. Now, EndNote is described really clearly in this great image from used with permission from James Cook University Library. It essentially is an application that sits on your computer and also stores your information in the cloud. It allows you to take the database, the reference information from databases and or to write your own references and to edit and organize and add PDFs within the EndNote software so that you can organize your lists of references, you can tie them and connect them to the PDF documents themselves, and you can optionally sync these online so that you can access them from any computer. The real, real beauty of EndNote is the automatic insertion of in-text citations and reference lists in Word. Uh, it means that you can automatically put in a citation when you're typing and it will add the reference in your reference list at the end of your document automatically. Now, EndNote is a bit tricky to understand. It's not a terribly intuitive piece of software and it will take you a little bit of time to get your head around. However, if you are going to be doing a lot of referencing, it may you may decide it's worth the time investment uh, to, but you, I would, would expect that it would take you a little bit of time to get used to it. Um, and you do still need to double check the references at the end. You can't just assume and rely on the information that gets sucked in from the databases because this isn't always uh, correct either. So essentially no tool is absolutely foolproof, uh, but it's really important that you use the academic referencing tool and referencing summary to make sure that your references are set up correctly for your assessments. And this is particularly so for TL students because it's not only about your own academic integrity and the submission of a correct reference list and citation for the assessment, it's also because this will form part of your role when you are in a school as a teacher librarian. Students and teachers will ask you for advice on referencing and you will need to be across how to do this or at the very least know where to find the information on how to correctly reference even if you're in a primary school, there's lots of teachers who are usually studying and you can build really great relationships with them by offering to support them with this referencing, which it, honestly, it is a bit tricky for all of us. So it's a, definitely a skill set that is worthwhile to develop as a teacher librarian, as well as a current master's student. Another key part of referencing is presenting the final reference list in a hanging indent. And setting this up is actually really quite quick and easy and really worth your time because once you set it up, you'll see how quick and easy it is and it makes very good sense to do the right thing the first time and just have it done correctly. So I will show you now how to do that in Word. 
You've been working hard and you finally have your reference list almost complete, but you realise that you haven't presented it with a hanging indent. Don't worry, it's very easy to set this up. Now you can see here that I have a list of references. If I simply highlight these references and then go to Layout and click this little arrow here, I can open up the paragraph setting and you can see in the indentation section under special, it currently has no special indentation, but I can choose hanging. If I choose hanging, I can also adjust how much I want the indentation to be. This looks about right to me. And then just click OK. And you can see that it will automatically make your reference list a hanging indent reference. Now it's really useful and important to present it in this way to meet APA 7 requirements. And you can see just how easily and quickly that was achieved by using simply layout, the little arrow to open up the paragraph and go to special and making that hanging. So it's really quite quick and easy to do. So thanks very much. You're all done and you're all set and ready to submit your best looking assessment piece.